What happens to real estate in a recession? You wouldn't believe how many times I've been asked that question. I have had the fortune or the misfortune of going through a couple of recessions. The last one in 2008 was treacherous. It was a tough recession. It was labeled by many as the Great Recession, meaning that it was as close and as deep a recession as you could get before you went into a depression. So it was a great field test. I mean, there we were in the middle of all that chaos and we were watching this strategy just handle everything that that recession could throw at it. It's doing the same thing in COVID. It's booming during the chaos. So it's a wonderful strategy and we're gonna talk about how and why this strategy is able to survive such difficult times. My name is Mitch Steven and I've been seller financing houses for over two decades. And I have been through a recession or two. The last recession was tough and I'm gonna tell you, it's a great strategy because when you can make money during the most chaotic of times, it's a wonderful strategy. If you do good in the good times, but you boom in the bad times, you would wanna think there's no way to go broke, wouldn't you? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But right now, we're gonna talk about how and why the owner finance strategy can survive such chaos. Now to believe in the seller financing strategy and to believe in what I'm about to tell you, you have to believe in at least two things. So the first thing you need to believe is that during a recession, the banks are gonna close shop. They're gonna tighten up so tight, it's as if they're closed. I think it's the definition of a recession. Either the banks cause the recession because they close up or the recession causes the banks to close up. But either way, can we agree that during a recession, the banks are not open for business? They're just pushing through. The second thing we have to believe is that a person paying X amount of rent would rather pay that same X to buy a house if they only knew how. Now, I don't know if the statistics are 85% of the renters would rather own or 83% or 92% or 78% or I don't know what percent. By the way, did y'all know that all statistics are made up on the spot? Just kidding. So if we can believe in those two things, I'm going to take you down a path. Don't think too hard about the questions I'm about to ask you. Just give the common sense answer. Question number one, when banks close, what happens to the price of houses? Don't struggle with it. Banks close. Most people need a bank to buy a house. They need a bank or a mortgage company. And when those people close down, there's not money for the average person to get a house, right? So if people can't borrow money to buy houses, what happens to the price of houses? They go down, right? Less people looking for houses because less people can pay cash for a house. If people can't buy a house, what kind of house are they living in? They can't buy a house, so they're living in some kind of house. What kind of house do they live in? They live in a rent house, right? Next question. When there's a lot of pressures put on rents, what happens to the price of rents? They go up, right? When there's a lot of pressure, a lot of people renting, and there's a lot of demand for rentals, then the price of rent goes up. What have I told you that my owner financed value is based upon? It's based upon the rents. So in the middle of 2008, when everyone was having to be a renter, rents were going up. I had the only appreciating property value on the planet. And the only reason it was appreciating because I was willing to sell or finance my houses for a monthly payment that was equal to the rent and the rents were going up. So the house prices were decreasing, but the rents were going up. So I was able to buy houses at the low of the low of the low because guess what? I didn't need a bank to buy houses because I had all this private money. Private money will change your life, and especially during a recession or, or some point of chaos. So I was buying these houses at prices from 15 years ago, and then I was turning right around and selling them for more than I had ever sold my houses for before because the rents were going up because there were so many people that needed to rent houses because no one could buy a house. So it's a very, very strange dynamic. Even my bankers who graduated from Harvard and all these high class schools, they didn't want to believe me when I was telling them when the recession hits, I'm going to boom. And, and they wouldn't believe me until I walked in during the recession, my houses were full, my down payments were big and plentiful, and I had lots of money in the bank, and I, and I was selling my houses for more than I'd ever sold them for before. 
And they knew my financials. And they could see it on my financials. And they asked me, you know, how, how can this be? I said, well, I'm just offering a, a sales price that reflects what they're paying monthly for a rental. And it didn't matter that I was buying this house for a depressed price of 27000 a price from 15 years ago. And now I was selling that house for over 100% markup. I was selling these houses for $59,000 and $60,000. I was buying them one day for $27,000 cash with my private lender's money. Within the next nine days, I would sell that house for $59,000 to a person who couldn't get a real loan, but didn't appreciate their landlord as much as they would appreciate owning their own home, given the fact that they were gonna pay just about the same amount either way every month. It's a hugely weird dynamic but it works in your favor. And again, when you have a business that does good in the good times and booms during the bad times, when is it you go broke? Well, the tendency is to say, well, you can't go broke. Well, you can. And you can go broke if you over leverage and borrow too much money on houses that you shouldn't borrow that much. I only borrow 65%. So if I want to buy a house for 70% of the owner finance value, then I got to bring 5% myself. And this is one way that I protect my investors. I never let them loan me over 65% of what the rents tell me I can sell the house for at the time of the transaction. The other way to go broke is if you don't have integrity. Because if you don't have integrity and you lie to your buyers and you cover up things and then you sell them a house, lawsuits will break you. Lawsuits are expensive and no one really wins in a lawsuit anyways, except for the attorneys. So you over leverage, you don't have integrity in getting lawsuits, or number three, if you don't conform to some state and federal guidelines, you could be in some trouble. So you got to do those three things. If you can police yourself, not over leverage, have integrity and be honest with your buyers. I mean, if there's nuclear waste in the backyard, then handle it. You know, don't pass it along and try to get away with it, selling it to someone else. I mean, if you, if you find out about it, handle your own problems. And then last but not least, conform with some state and federal regulations. And if you'll do those things, then you should have a great business because the seller finance strategy is a terrific business in the good times and even better business in the bad times. So if you like this conversation, please hit subscribe, please hit like, and so we can uh, boost our ratings up there with the powers that be. And if you'd like to get a free copy of my book, My Life in a Thousand Houses, Failing Forward to Financial Freedom, just go to 1000houses.com, click on the tab that says Mitch's Books, and there you'll see an offer for a free copy of my book. All you have to do is pay shipping and handling, which I think today is about seven bucks. And I'll send you this book for free. And because you ordered it direct from my website, it'll come as an autographed copy right there. I appreciate you taking the time and I hope you get your book soon. This is Mitch. See you in the next episode.